All right, let's do a quick quick request on this just to give you a little extra practice. Say that I uh, I exert 20 joules of energy to increase the energy or no, let's say this, to lift a five kilogram object let's make that a one kilogram object sorry doing this on the fly a one kilogram object one meter in height what is my efficiency All right, now the first thing you'll need to do is to figure out what is my change in energy for this object. I'm taking a one kilogram object and I'm moving it up one meter in height. And so I've changed what type of energy in that case? I've changed the potential energy. So you have the input energy, which is 20 joules, and then your output energy is going to be whatever that change in potential is for this, this one kilogram object. All right, in just a minute I'll come up with a few options for you, but go ahead and start working that. Let me think about this. Okay, is your efficiency 20%, 50%, or 80%? You can try it out. I exert 20 joules of energy to lift a one kilogram object one meter in height. What is my efficiency? That is what percentage of my total energy went into actually changing the energy of that object. All right, I'll stop at uh, 105, 105. Okay, let's take a look here at uh, our work in. That is, uh, the energy that we're putting into this is what? 20 joules, right. So I'm... I exert 20 joules of energy. That is, my whole body is putting in 20 joules of energy. That's the total amount of energy. And my output energy is going to be what? It's equal to the change in the potential energy of the object, which is equal to m times g times h. That's 1 kilogram times 10 meters per second squared times h, which is 1 meter. So that's equal to 10 uh, joules. All right. So if I have, I'm putting in 20 joules of energy, but I'm only getting out 10 joules of energy, what is my efficiency? Can we try that again? If I'm putting in 20 joules of energy and I'm getting out 10 joules of energy, what is my efficiency? And that 10 meters per second squared is the acceleration due to gravity. I'll stop at 50 seconds. 50 seconds. Okay, that's a lot better. You need to identify, you know, what is my input, what is my output energy. And here you're only getting out 10 joules when you really put in 20 joules. So you're only getting half of what you put in. 
So that's only a 50% efficiency. We'll see that again once more when we get to uh, the human body later in this chapter. Maybe today, maybe next time. And so if you're still not grasping that completely, don't worry, we'll see it again. The idea of efficiency and it's a ratio of our output and input powers or work. All right, let's look at uh, temperature. You've probably seen temperature scales before, uh, but we're going to revisit them for a bit and talk about the different types of temperature scales that we use, what they're based on, uh, how we convert between one temperature scale to another, um, and then how that comes into when we talk about the flow of heat, our thermal energy. All right, so temperature and heat. Um, we have three temperature scales that are commonly used. One that we use most commonly is the Fahrenheit scale. It's German, by the way. I think it means Fahren is to drive, Height, I think, is heat. Am I correct on that? I had German in college, but I've forgotten it. So it's like to drive heat. Fahren does mean drive. I think height means heat. So we have the Fahrenheit scale, um, the Celsius scale, and then we also have the Kelvin scale. The Kelvin scale is named after Lord Kelvin, who was a scientist, physicist, I think in the 1700s maybe. Um, what, the one that we most commonly use is the Fahrenheit scale. You might know which is the SI scale. Kelvin is the SI scale. Very good, yeah. So Kelvin is our SI scale. Now each of these, anytime you have a, a temperature scale, you have to base it on, on two physical quantities. Right? So for example, the Fahrenheit scale is based on two physical quantities. Likewise, Celsius scale is based on those two same physical quantities. And then the Kelvin scale is based on something a little bit different. Uh, so what you want to do is you have two quantities. You have a known temperature for something occurring and then a known temperature for something else occurring. And you say there are X number of degrees between those two, those two points. And then you have a scale and a way to measure temperature. So the Fahrenheit scale, for example, is based on the boiling and freezing points of water. The uh, boiling point of water is just, it's just ascribed to be 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So this just defined that we will say the temperature at which water boils is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And the freezing point which of course is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so it's based on the boiling and freezing points of water. Likewise, the Celsius scale is also based on the boiling and freezing points of water. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. And the freezing point is 0 degrees Celsius. So the Celsius scale is really is a lot easier to use, which is why most of the world uses it. I think uh, the U.S. is one of the few countries that actually still uses the Fahrenheit scale just because of tradition or whatever. Uh, but the Celsius scale is really easy because you have these very uh, set values for the boiling and freezing points of water. So if I were to draw two thermometers, they look like this. So thermometer, it's like a baseball bat. The boiling and freezing points of water on both of these would be the same. All right, this is my Fahrenheit. This is my Celsius scale. And we would just say that this is 212 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's only 100 degrees Celsius. And this is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's only it's 0 degrees Celsius. So that's how we set that. And then because of these values that we set for these physical points, then we can determine what is the size of these individual degrees. So for example, between the boiling and freezing points of water, there are what, 180 degrees Fahrenheit between those two points. But between the boiling and, points, boiling and freezing points of water on the Celsius scale, there are how many degrees between them? There are just 100. So there are a lot fewer divisions between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius than there are between 32 and 212. 
So the Celsius degree then is, is it bigger or smaller than the Fahrenheit degree? It's a bigger, yeah, it's bigger. And I've drawn it this way here. So that each division in the Celsius scale is bigger than each division in the Fahrenheit scale, almost by a factor of two, right? Because this is 180 degrees, but this is only 100 degrees. Hmm? 1.8, right, almost a factor of two. Uh, we'll come back to that in just a bit. Now, the Kelvin scale is based on a little bit different. It's based on absolute zero. We've seen absolute zero before. Absolute zero is that temperature at which all motion ceases in, the, in your atoms, so like the electrons would stop moving. Everything would just stop moving altogether, and that would be the absolutely lowest temperature that you can go. Uh, that's a theoretical temperature. You can't actually approach it because you can't stop the motion of those atoms. But you can get really darn close, like down to milli, micro, or even nano Kelvin with some, uh, if you use like liquid helium, like remember the supercooled helium that we saw? I don't think that approached nano, nano Kelvin temperatures, but it did approach uh, milli or micro Kelvin. All right, so it's based on absolute zero and the freezing point of water. And absolute zero is called zero Kelvin, and the freezing point of water is called 273 Kelvin. It's actually 273 point something something Kelvin, but we don't worry about that. It's actually not the freezing point of water exactly. It's a little bit just above the freezing point of water. You don't need to write this down, but I think it's kind of interesting, and you can tell your friends about it later. The Kelvin scale is actually based, as you might know, absolute zero and what else? It's something called the triple point of water. You ever heard of the triple point of water? No, it's really kind of cool, actually. It is a certain temperature and pressure at which water can exist in all three phases. So you know the phases of matter, which we'll touch on in just a bit, but the phases of matter are liquid, solid, and gas, right? Um, and so there is a temperature and a pressure at which water exists all at the same time as a liquid, as a liquid water, as a solid, ice, and then also as a gas. Not as steam, obviously, but as a vapor, kind of like the gas that you would see inside your freezer. So it's actually based on the, uh, not the freezing point of water, the triple point of water, excuse me, the, the triple point of water. But don't write that down. That's just for you to impress your friends later on. Okay? All right. So um, let's see, where was I? Oh, there are some pretty simple conversions between these three. Oh, one other thing, I'm sorry. Uh, a change in temperature of one Kelvin is the same as, is equal to, a change in temperature of one degree Celsius. Right. Those sizes and degrees are the same, the way that their scales are set up. There are some simple ways to convert between um, Fahrenheit and Celsius. Can I go down to the next slide? You don't need to memorize these equations, though you will likely see a problem where you have to convert either from Fahrenheit to Celsius or Celsius to Fahrenheit, but I'll provide you with the equations on the next test. I don't expect you to remember them. I don't remember them. Uh, but the, the Fahrenheit temperature, which I'll call Tf, is equal to 9 fifths of the Celsius temperature plus 32. And then I can rewrite this equation in terms of the Celsius temp temperature, solving this for Tc, and it's equal to 5 ninths times Tf minus 32. These numbers come about, if you remember, uh, we had a 1.8 difference between the size of our degrees, and that's where this fraction comes, comes about, because if I convert this into decimal form, it's equal to what? 9 fifths. It's equal to 1.8. That's 10 over, or, uh, 18 over 10, which is 1.8. So that's where that comes from. And the 32 obviously comes from the difference between the freezing point in the Fahrenheit and the freezing point in Celsius. You don't need to know that. And you also don't need to uh, 
memorize these equations because I'll provide them for you. I'll probably just write them on the board or something when it comes time to the test. But you will likely have to know how to convert from one temperature to another. So I'll provide you, say, with a Fahrenheit temperature or a Celsius temperature, and you have to figure out what is the, the temperature in Celsius. So for example, let's say that um, I want to convert 70 degrees Fahrenheit. to some degree Celsius. Does anybody know what room temperature is in the Celsius scale approximately? Okay, well, 70 degrees, that's about room temperature. That's about the temperature in this room. And it's about 20 degrees Celsius. So a nice day is about a 20 degree day in the Celsius scale. So if I wanted to convert 70 degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius, I would use this. And I would say that the temperature in Celsius is just five nights times 70 minus 32 and that's going to be um, 21 degrees right all right and then the Fahrenheit scale let's say that I want to convert 98 degrees Fahrenheit which is about our body temperature, 98.6, uh, to the Celsius. You might know the body temperature in Celsius. Yeah, you're right, 37. So uh, it would be 37.7. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're actually using this. Is that what you meant? Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, so we're using this because we're converting to Celsius. I'm sorry. So T Celsius is equal to uh, 5 ninths times 98 minus 32, and that's equal, as Destiny said, to 37 degrees Celsius. So those are some good common temperatures that, that you should just sort of keep in your mind. And also remembering that a change in temperature of 2 degrees are of a, uh, one degree Celsius is approximately two degrees Fahrenheit, about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. All right. Let's try a couple of quick questions here. All right, so first of all, what is the largest unit? One Celsius, one Kelvin, or one Fahrenheit degree? Is it Celsius, Kelvin, Fahrenheit? Both Celsius and Kelvin are both Fahrenheit and Celsius. Which is the largest unit? All right, I'll stop at 105, 105. Very good. Very good. Celsius and Kelvin are both the larger units. Uh, if you put A, that's sort of like the next best answer, though it's not entirely true because it's the same as the Kelvin degree. Uh, so a Kelvin is equal to a degree Celsius. B is the right answer, and both of those are bigger than a Fahrenheit. Uh, it turns out that minus 40 degrees Celsius is the same temperature as minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Is there a temperature at which the Kelvin and Celsius scales agree? Think about this. We haven't said this explicitly, but I think that you can reason it out. Is there? A, it just turns out that minus 40 Celsius and Fahrenheit is the same, that that's the same temperature. 
But is there a temperature at which Kelvin and Celsius degree scales agree? Remember, in the Kelvin scale, zero Kelvin is absolute zero, and 273 Kelvin is the freezing point of water. And the Kelvin degree and the Celsius degree are the same. Uh, we're looking here for a place where, like for example, 10 Kelvin would equal 10 degrees Celsius. You understand? I'm not sure that y'all understand. In the same way that minus 40 degrees Celsius and minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, those are the same temperatures. Like if you went out and it's minus 40 Celsius, you could also say it's minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we're looking for a place, or is there a place, where a certain temperature in Kelvin is equal to the same number in degrees Celsius. Uh-huh. Yeah. But unfortunately not by many folks in the room. So think about this. I'm going to help you out a little bit, okay? So imagine that we have two temperature scales. All right, that's, uh, we'll call this the Kelvin scale. And this is the Celsius scale. All right, now the Celsius scale is based on the boiling point of water. This is the boiling point, and it's equal to 100 degrees. And the freezing point of water, and it's equal to zero degrees. All right, now the Kelvin scale on the other hand, is based on absolute zero, I'll call it AZ, uh, and this is equal to zero Kelvin, and the freezing point of water, which I didn't tell you all this before, but the freezing point of water is equal to 273 Kelvin. I think I did tell you all that, actually. Didn't I tell you all that? No. So is there a place where the temperature scales will agree? That is, one number on Kelvin will be the same number on the Celsius scale. And remember, the size of them are the same. Okay, I'll just give you about 10 more seconds. I'll stop at 3.55. Brace yourself. Yeah, so at 200, minus 273 degrees Celsius, which would be down here, minus 273 degrees Celsius, that's equal to zero Kelvin. So those aren't the same numbers, right? Like minus 273 degrees Celsius isn't equal to minus 273 Kelvin. In fact, there is no minus 273 Kelvin, right? It goes to zero and then it stops. It doesn't go below zero. Um, at zero degrees Celsius, it's equal to 273 Kelvin. So zero, is, that's not the same as 273. And at zero Kelvin, that's minus 273 Celsius. So what's the, an what's the appropriate answer here? It's no, right? So there, there is no temperature at which these equal. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. So, zero Kelvin is equal to minus 273. All right, but this question isn't asking that. Huh? You're asking, this is asking, let me pull it up. You want the same number. So, on the Celsius and Fahrenheit scale, there is a temperature, minus 40 degrees. It just so happens 
that minus 40 Celsius equals minus 40 Fahrenheit. Those are the same temperatures. If you have that temperature, you could describe it as either way. But there is no temp there is no such temperature on the Celsius and Kelvin scales because of the way the point is here, they're just offset from one another. The, the Kelvin and Celsius scales, they have the same size of degree, but then they're offset from one another. Oh, 100 degrees Celsius would be 373 Kelvin. Hmm? N no, that's not right. I'm not sure what you're reading, but that's not right. Look, 100 degrees Celsius... 100 degrees Celsius is equal to 373. Let me see. Oh, no, that's... Let me let me explain this. Can I borrow this for just a second? Look, guys, this... On page 81, that's just not a very well-drawn figure. On page 81, it does say that 100 degrees Celsius equals 100 Kelvin. What that means is that a change in 100 degrees Celsius equals a change in 100 Kelvin. Understand the difference there? That it says 100 degrees Celsius equals 100 Kelvin. That's not entirely true. What it means is that a change in temperature equal to 100 degrees Celsius is equal to a change in 100 Kelvin. That if my temperature increases by 100 degrees Celsius, that's the same as saying that my temperature has increased by 100 Kelvin, which is the same as saying also that the Kelvin degree is equal to the Celsius degree. That's correct. Yeah. And that's, that's the point I'm trying to get to, that one, the Celsius degree is bigger than the Fahrenheit degree, and the Celsius degree is the same size as the Kelvin degree. I'm sorry for that, but that, that figure is just a little misleading, I understand. All right? All right, any other questions? All right, you'll see a few questions, just sort of what are these scales based on, and then also uh, conversions between scales, Celsius and Fahrenheit. I'm not sure how I'll do that, because I think you would need a calculator to do that. I have to think of some ways to do that. Uh, and then also, uh, the Celsius and the Kelvin scales, they have the same size of degrees. In fact, they're really just offset from one another by 273 degrees. All right? They're simply offset from one another. So at every point on, any, on either scale, you're just going to add or subtract 273 to get the other scale. That's right. So uh, 0 Kelvin would equal n your minus 273 degrees Celsius. I won't ask you to convert between Celsius to Kelvin, but you will need to know how these scales are set up. And it's fairly simple to convert, but I'm not going to ask that. All right. All right, let's move on. And uh, we're going to look at different types of heat. Uh, first, we'll define a few things about heat. Thermal contact, thermal equilibrium. And then we'll talk about phase changes. You've probably seen this in high school or even are in chemistry, college chemistry, if you've had that. How many of you have had chemistry? Many of you have had it. Or no? It's a few of you. Okay. Well, we're going to do a little bit of calorimetry, uh, which is just talking about how heat flows from one substance to another. And, um, and then look at heat transfer through conduction, convection, and radiation. Oh, let's see. This was B. All right, so now we're going to talk about heat. Heat is not a form of energy per se. Heat is defined as the transfer of thermal energy. It's the transfer of thermal energy. Uh, so whenever we talk about heat, we're not talking about thermal energy. We're talking about uh, thermal energy going from one point to another. 
Uh, in the course of this, we need to describe thermal contact. Thermal contact is really uh, just a situation where thermal energy can flow from one point to another. So, for example, which of these are, uh, we like to go camping a lot, right? And when we go camping, we do what? Around the fire. We roast marshmallows around the fire. Uh, and there are a couple ways you can roast marshmallows. Like, we have these nice metal rods that we use, and we stick them in the fire. But what happens if you, if you hold the metal rod for too long? They get hot, right? Ours are actually designed because they have a lot of ways to disperse heat along the way. But uh, if you hold a piece of metal in the fire, eventually that heat is going to come up to your hand and it'll burn you, right? So you would say that you are in thermal contact with the fire. Now there's some, some loss of thermal energy as you go along, so it's not the same as sticking your hand in the fire, which would be very, very bad, but it still is thermal contact. So uh, an example of thermal contact would be uh, roasting a marshmallow, right? With a, with a coat hanger or with a metal rod. On the other hand, if you have something, say, like uh, a piece of wood, like you go out and you get a branch off a tree and you strip it down and you put your marshmallow on the end, are you in thermal contact with the fire? No, not nearly as much so. In fact, we'll talk about the differences between metal and wood in this case and why you're in more thermal contact with the fire with the metal than with the wood based on something we call the thermal conductivity which we'll come to in just a bit. Right? Um, that is that metal conducts heat a lot better than, it condu than wood conducts heat. Right? We also need to define thermal equilibrium. Uh, this occurs when there is no heat flow between two objects. And the only way for there to be no heat flow between two objects is when, when what is true about those two objects. When they both have the same temperature. So if I have a 100 degree object and a 50 degree object and I bring them together, there is going to be heat flow from the warmer object to the cooler object, right, if they're in thermal contact. Until the point they reach equilibrium, some temperature between 50 and 100, uh, depending upon the type of material and the amount of material, uh, when they reach thermal equilibrium. For example, if I have a 100 degree Celsius object and a 50 degree Celsius object, these are not in thermal equilibrium. Right? However, they do have thermal contact between one another. They're touching, thus they're allowing the flow of heat from one to the other. And the flow of heat is always going to be from the warmer object to the cooler object until they reach thermal equilibrium and they reach some intermediate temperature. In this case, if they had the same mass and they were the same type of material, they would each reach a temperature of 75 degrees Celsius. But we'll see a little bit later that that doesn't have to be the case, that they can reach a temperature that's either above or below 75 degrees Celsius. And by getting 75, I just split the difference between their temperature difference. But that's only true if they have the same amount and the same type of material. Let me write this. So they reach 75. Only if. The two materials are the same type and the same amount.
let me write this as a sort of an addendum to uh, the thermal energy. The total amount of energy inside an object And we're going to call this, you know, thermal energy. So this total amount of energy is characterized by its temperature. It's dependent upon the type and amount of material. Dependent upon the type and amount. We'll see how that's very important when we get into the, a discussion of specific heat. And we'll work some problems dealing with specific heat and dealing with calorimetry. All right. Um, I want to watch a little video. This is from the Veritasium series. And he talks about temperature and, uh, and sort of our conception of temperature. Can I come away from this? This guy is Australian, all right? And... He, for the longest time, I couldn't understand what he was saying. He does this little demo where he has a piece of plastic and he puts ice on it. And then he has a piece of something that I thought was like this really exotic metal. And I thought, gosh, I really got to get some of that. And he calls it aluminum. You don't know what aluminum is? Aluminum. Yeah. And so I, for the longest time I watched this, I'm like, gosh, I need to get some of this stuff. This aluminum. But it's aluminum is what he's talking about. All right, it's painted black, I think, so you can't tell very well. But uh, anyway, just keep that in mind. So hopefully, you won't be as baffled as I was. You know, a similar thing occurs in the opposite end of the spectrum. Like it, uh, this is true for cold things that the aluminum or the aluminium. You have to start calling it aluminium, I think. But a similar thing occurs on the hot end, right? So any of y'all bake cakes or whatever? Yeah, you bake a cake, you put it in the oven in a metal pan, uh, you pull it out. The metal pan is hella hot, right? It's like 350 degrees or whatever. But have you ever tried touching the cake with your finger? You can touch the cake all day. You, you can even put your finger on there and just leave it for an extended period of time. But if you try touching the pan, have you ever done that? Yeah, you try touching the pan and... You get very bad burns, even in a very short amount of time. It's not that the cake is cooler. The cake is still at 350 degrees or whatever, but uh, it doesn't transfer heat to your finger as quickly. And so it, that energy doesn't come into your body as quickly. All right? Uh, the same is true. I remember we got some of those silicone pans. You know, they've seen the silicone, they're bendy pans, and th they were useless. Like, eventually we just got rid of them. But uh, to bake cakes in, and I thought, you know, silicone... That should be like the cake, right? I should be able to touch it. But silicone actually has a pretty high rate of conductivity. So the silicone pan, which you would expect, you'd be able to touch because you would, ex I don't know, I thought its conductivity would be quite low. It's actually quite high. So it, it's hot like the metal pan is. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. That doesn't make sense, does it? I'll have to find out about that. Yeah. I guess that's why I thought the silicone pan was a low conductivity. I don't know, Destiny. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll need to think about that. I don't know. I have to look into it. All right. That's okay. I think we know it. There's a little silicone mitt. Yeah. Right. Like they have in the chemistry lab. They have them in the chemistry lab. Or similar to that. What's that? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, the pan burnt me. And my wife said, what do you expect? It was in the oven. Uh, okay. A few more minutes, I'll give you a quiz. Um, and we'll talk about thermal conductivity next time. Uh, all right, so... When we transfer energy... from one object to another
the object has a change in temperature. Hopefully that's obvious. Um, it might not be obvious. Like we might not ever really think about why our temperature changes. But the temperature of a particular object changes because of a transfer of energy either into the object or out of the object. When we get into calorimetry next time where we look at how this temperature changes, that'll be a crucial idea. That temperature changes are the result of energy either going into the object or out of the object. Right? Uh, or energy going into the object can result in a phase change. There are three phases of matter, of course, solids, liquids, gas. Um, we're not going to talk about them. Can I show you a video, though? Because this is just fun, really. Anybody know they might be giant? You all know the band? They might be giant? Yeah, they've put out a series of like educational videos. So this is really for grade school kids, but humor me, because I think it's kind of fun. Um, it actually requires quite a lot of energy to change from a solid to a liquid to a gas. So if we're going from a solid to a liquid, do I have to put in energy or take away energy? Now, to go from a solid to a liquid, say I want to change ice into water, I have to put in energy. And likewise, if I want to change water to steam or to a gas, I have to put in energy. And I have to put in a lot of energy. And we'll talk about how this relates to the cooling of the human body through evaporation. Because really, you cool your body through evaporation, water on your skin in a liquid form, converts to a gas, and that takes away a lot of energy from your body. Uh, so we require this, this energy to result in a phase change. If we were to plot out the, say, energy versus temperature. So I'm going to make a plot here. On this scale, I will have the temperature. And on this scale, I will have the energy. Oh, well, let's see, they might have a similar plot in your book. I don't remember. Let me check. No. Okay, so temperature and energy. As I put energy into an object, so say, for example, I take some ice and put it in a pan on the stove. As time goes on, I'm putting energy into that object. The first thing that it's going to do is it's going to take the ice, say that, say we have ice and it's at minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, for example. Uh, and it's going to increase the temperature of this ice. All in this regime is going to be ice until it gets up to a temperature of 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, right? which is the freezing point of water. And then at that time, I'm going to continue putting energy into the ice, uh, but then I'm going to get a mixture of ice plus water. Because as I continue putting energy into that ice, it's going to convert some of that ice into water until all of it is converted into water. But all along, as you're putting energy into this, the temperature of this ice-water mixture does not change. does not change at all. all right? Until... I get all of the ice converted to water, and then the temperature will begin rising again. So over here, I only have water until it reaches a certain temperature. What temperature does it have to reach? The what? It reaches 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, and in this point, it's going to start converting that water into steam. So we're going to have a, a regime here where I'm going to have water, liquid water, plus steam. So I have a liquid and a gas, and it will increase the temperature of that until all of it is converted into steam. And once I've converted it all into steam, then the temperature of the steam can continue increasing forever, basically. Not forever, eventually it become a separate type of uh, 
a separate stage of matter, which would be called a plasma. It would actually ionize the gas. All right. So as I put energy into a substance, it can cause it to increase its temperature. And then if it's at the temperature where it changes phase, as I put energy into it, it's going to cause it to change phase. All right. This is called the latent heat, which we'll get to next time. And then when I reach a certain phase, so here I'm all in the liquid phase, it increases the temperature up to a certain point until I get the reach the boiling point of water. And then I have a liquid and a gas in one area. And then I add more energy. And then once I get all that liquid converted to gas, it uh, increases the temperature of the steam. We'll get into this and we'll see, we'll talk about latent heats and specific heats next time. And we'll do a few calculations. And then next time we'll also get into uh, the body and how some of these things are related to the body.